Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we truly give thanks for this day, even though it isn't the prettiest day, but it's a day that you have given to us. And you have given us the opportunity to come here together and be instructed by your word, which gives us guidance and counsel. And I pray that we would be ladies this morning that would be receptive to what it is that you have to teach us, Lord. That we would be willing to apply it to our hearts and to our minds and then even our hands as we learn what it is, Lord, to, to take our towels in hand and serve. So I pray, Lord, in your name, who is the master servant leader of all, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you know the theme of our lesson, it is the, um, the servant leadership of Jesus himself and the towel that he took up, so that's the, the lesson. I hope you had time to look at, look at your um, Bible study, do your Bible study, read the scripture because it will help you as I begin to unfold some of this. But if you haven't, um, we're glad you're here and you'll still have opportunity to learn a lot about you. John chapter 13 this morning. But we're in the third major portion of John now. The first portion was the prologue. Mia had these nifty little notebooks a few weeks ago, and she had a little small notebook um, representing the prologue, which is just the first 18 verses of chapter 1. And then she had a bigger notebook, which represented the second section of our study, which is the light reveal, which we have been studying. We are now in a new um, part of the study of John, and this one is called Seeing His Glory. That's what our author has named it. I loved it. I, when I am studying, I often have the outline um, open in front of me so I can be referring to it regularly during my study time. So I hope that you have looked at the outline and you understand where we are in the book. It'll help you study. So um, one of the commentators that I was reading this week divided the book into three parts, the first one being the prologue, and the second one he called the book of signs, and the third one he called the book of glory. And I love that outline too, because the book of signs is what we just finished. We've just been talking about signs. We've written six signs down in our little page where we have our chart for the signs. I hope you've done that. But in that book of signs, we would often see either a discourse that would then be followed by a sign, or we would see a sign which was then followed by a discourse, something that Jesus said. I'll give you two examples. The um, feeding of the 5,000 was in chapter 6 of John. But it was right after the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So not only did he say something, but he demonstrated it with what he was all about. <coughs> Same thing within John chapter 8 and 9 when Jesus was there at the, um, the Feast of the Tabernacle. And he calls himself the light of the world. And the very next thing he does in chapter 8 is heals the blind man. So he's all about these signs, but not just telling us a bunch of words, but he's demonstrating it in his actions as well. So um, the claims and credentials in the book of signs are consistent with the points that he was making. So the uniqueness of Christ is not merely a matter of what he claimed, because anybody can claim anything, but it's what he followed the claims with, and that was what he did. And that is what makes Jesus so different, along with many other things. But he did exactly what he had said. But he was rejected. And at the end of chapter 12, me and Thomas, chapter 12 last week, we find in verse 37, it says, Though he had done so many signs before them, and what was one of the signs? He raised somebody from the dead. But though he had done so many signs, they still did not believe in him. So we are coming out of the book of signs, and now in chapter 13, we're coming into the section on the book of glory. From this point on, we are going to be seeing that Jesus is preparing for glory. Now, last week, Mia talked to us 
um, a little bit about what that word glory meant. And I wrote a couple of things down, and I thought about it during the week, because don't we want to think about Easter Sunday? He rose from the dead. That's the glory. That's not all the glory, girls. The glory also includes the crucifixion. <coughs> the crucifixion is part of that glorification. Jesus' death was not a tragedy. Jesus' death was not a martyrdom. Jesus said himself, no one takes my life from me. I have laid it down on my own initiative, and I will take it up again. This authority I received from my Father. Also, he says later, was it not for this hour that I have come right before he goes to the cross? So we know Jesus was born to die. And yes, the resurrection is an incredibly, incredible, wonderful ending to that story. But it is very important for us to remember that the crucifixion is a part of his glory as well. And in my last few lessons, I've been putting the cross over here in the corner because this is where Jesus is heading. And he can see it now. He is really close. In fact, he's 24 hours away from the cross. Everything we're going to be studying in the next a few weeks is 24 in the next 24 hours. So um, the cross is very visible. Now when Mia mentioned to us last week that if you, when you read scripture, if you look for themes or for words, it'll help you know how to study. Well chapter 13 was a great example of that because 13 times we found out or we saw the word knew or know or understand. So as I began to dissect the chapter and think about the way it was laid out, I could not help but talk about these three things. What Jesus knew, we're going to talk about it, what Judas knew, and then what all people will know. And you'll see as, as I unfold some of that how it fits in with, the, with um, our chapter today. But I want you to listen. I'm going to read the scripture, but I'm going to read it in portions. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read some portions. So just follow along with me. Get your scripture out and um, have it there so that you can take some notes if you want and certainly refer to the scripture. So let's take a look at these verses. I want you to listen carefully because this is a very, very important text. And I can say this with, with every, every bit of sincerity I can muster up. It's going to make a difference in your life. If you listen to what God is saying to us in these words in chapter 13, it will make a difference in your life. So we're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 13. And it says, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing, there it is, verse 1, that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So the first thing that we see that Jesus knew was that his hour had come. Now we've seen that already. We've, we've been... We've looked at places where it is referenced, the hour, about Jesus. We saw it in chapter 2, verse 4, at the wedding. It said, my hour has not yet come. And then remember at the Feast of Booths, where they are talking about killing him, and he, he leaves. I don't know if it was miraculous, if he just disappears. I'm not real sure, but he gets out of there, and it says there, his hour has not yet come. And then in chapter 8, still at the Feast of Booth, another similar scenario, we are told that his hour has not yet come. So last week, in chapter 12, and in verse 23, we saw the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So that's the beginning of the glorification. That the hour is here. Now it's important for us to understand the setting and what is happening at at this particular time, um, Sunday, Mia talked to us last week. That was a triumphal entry. And that, was, that took place on Sunday of what we call today Holy Week. Um, and then on Monday, we saw the cleansing, or we didn't see it because John didn't write about it. 
But if you put all the Gospels together and you read about these scenarios in each Gospel, you'll put together one big picture of what it looked like. So Sunday was the entrance, like Mia taught us last week. Then Monday is the second cleansing of the temple. Now we did see a cleansing in John, but there were two cleansings. And so in Matthew, um, he notes the second cleansing of the temple that happened during this time of Holy Week. And um, uh, it was in Matthew chapter 21 on Monday. And then on Tuesday, if you continue to look at Matthew and you look at Luke, you will see that there was a lot of confrontations going on with the Jewish leaders during this time. And Jesus was defending himself and what he had come to do. And, and so that is happening then on Tuesday. Wednesday, none of the four Gospels tell us anything about what was happening during this week of Jesus' life. And then Thursday is where we are. Thursday is where we are right now. And it is the Passover. So I hope you filled that in on your celebrations uh, because this is the last one that we're going to be looking at. This is the end. This is how we know that Jesus had a ministry of three years because he celebrated three Passovers. And this is the last of the Passovers. So we are at the Passover. Now, I read several commentators, and I will just tell you, some of them have a different opinion about whether this was the final Passover. But the conservative ones that I tend to, to stand with said Judas only betrayed Christ one time. And so this is where the betrayal is, is um, written down in Scripture. So we believe this is the third and final Passover. And so that was happening. And with tw within 24 hours, Jesus is going to be crucified. Now, we find out in that very first verse that the first thing Jesus knew was that his hour had come. But we also find out that he said something else in that first verse, something that he knew, that he loved his own to the end. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about this right now because I, I'm going to develop it a little bit more as we get to the end of the chapter where he does talk about loving them. But he refers to it here when he says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, I want us to move next to what Judas knew because that's the very next verse that we come to in verse 2. And you can look at it with me. During supper... When the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, we're going to talk about Judas in a few minutes. Judas was not a believer. That is hard for me to get my mind around how Jesus allowed him to walk with his disciples for, for three full years and Judas was never on board. But the scriptures tell us that. But you know what is interesting here? Verse 3 tells us Jesus knew too. It wasn't a surprise to Jesus. Jesus knew. So that was another thing that Jesus knew. He knew that Judas would betray him as well. I'm competing with the rain. I hope I'm loud enough. I'm told that my voice carries, so if you can't hear me, raise your hand. And I will um, talk louder. But Jesus also knew that. Does that blow your mind? I mean, we are looking at a passage of Scripture where Jesus serves his disciples. And does he exclude Judas? No. He includes him. My goodness, what a picture to us. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. But if you go back to chapter 6, you'll find a verse in 64 where, Je where this is said. And Jesus says it. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe. And who would betray him? He knew from the beginning. And yet, he continued to let Judas handle the purse strings in, in, with his disciples, be the treasurer. He knew from the beginning. It's a remarkable concept that we see here that Jesus continued to serve him. We even see in John chapter 6, verses 70 and 71, where Jesus answered them, Did I not myself choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil? Now he met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So Jesus knew, and so did Judas. He knew. But I want to, this doesn't really fit into my outline very well, because it's not really what Jesus knew, 
but it is a result of what Jesus knew. So I'll put it right here. What Jesus did now was a result of what he knew. He knew these things. He knew his hour was come. He knew he loved these. He knew Judas would betray him. And now, what does he do? We're going to see that as we look at verse 4. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking the towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now I decided, I read a good bit about this this week, and I decided that I'll just demonstrate, demonstrate what that looked like. Jesus probably had some sort of belt on that, that was tying his robe. Um, and it, it says that he took the towel and he tied it around his waist. So I got myself a little hand towel here. And this is exactly what Jesus did. He tied that towel around his waist and leaving this part free so that as he was getting, what he was getting ready to do was to bend down on the floor and wash the disciples' feet and use the towel to dry it. So this is what it means here. Sometimes, some of the versions you'll see girded, and girded basically just means tied, just tied and around his waist and got ready to do the work of a servant because he knew who he was and because he was willing to serve other people. And let me emphasize, he was willing to serve Judas. Not just a non-believer, but one who was going to turn on him, who was going to turn him in to the Pharisees and those looking for him. Jesus was willing to serve. So we have to understand not only that he was willing to serve, but we have to understand it was incredibly humiliating. Now, when I was thinking about this, I read in one of the commentators, it would be like Queen Elizabeth coming to your house and sweeping your floor. Well, you know, that's not that big a deal to me, but you know what is a big deal? I cannot imagine Dowager Countess Violet Crawley from... <laughs> Our favorite show on TV. Can you imagine her coming in and cleaning your kitchen floor? That's the picture here, girls. Royalty. Leadership. Getting down on his hands and knees and serving. That's the picture. And it is unbelievably humble that Jesus was willing to do this. But the next point that I've got to make is the part that blows me away. Would someone turn to Luke 22? Does anybody have your Bible? Uh, we don't bring our Bibles so much because we've got our scripture in front of us. But um, I see that Angela has hers. Angela, turn to Luke chapter 22 and just read the head titles of that chapter. First of all, what is the, what's happening there? The plot to kill Jesus. Okay, it's, it's the plot to kill Jesus. Go on down. What's Jesus another head? Jesus is going to be betrayed. So what time is it? It's the same exact time. It's, it's the Passover meal. It's the same exact time. Do you come to another heading there that says something else? Um, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Okay. One more. Who is the greatest? Okay, there we go. All right. What is going on? Luke is going to give us a good picture here. And if each of you will turn to chapter 22 of Luke. If you have it in your Bible, if you don't, it's fine. I'll read it to you. But in Luke chapter 22, and in um, verse 24, let me just read to you. This is the same picture. This is Luke's version of what was taking place at the Passover. And in verse 24, it says, um, I can't see very well. This light's not bright enough for me. Let me tell you what. Greatest. 
Does that just strike you incredibly funny? Or maybe pitiful? Jesus is about to demonstrate to them that he is willing to be a servant, and they're worried about who's the greatest. What they're really worried about is where they're going to sit at the table. It's the table. I'll talk about that in just a second. They're trying to decide when we get to heaven, who's going to be on the right and who's going to be on the left. You know, I think this story, um, to me, demonstrates how true the Bible is. If I were editing the Bible for these people, which is ridiculous, but if I was, I'd say, leave this part out. It makes you look too stupid. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I don't tell people the really bad things about me because they think less of me. But they are the writer of John and Luke and Matthew and all the scripture are, they tell it all. And they let you know that these men were made of clay, just like you and I. And here they were distracted by who was going to be the greatest. Really? It's, it's just unbelievable to me. Well, Jesus goes on in, in, in Mark chapter 10 and in Luke 22. He almost says the same thing. And let me read that. The kings and the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it's not like this way with you. But the one who is the greatest must become like the youngest. And the leader like the servant. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. What a great passage for us to see. Because we like to think who's greatest, who's got the most works that are really going to count, who's going to you know, have all the glorious riches in heaven. And Jesus is saying, it might surprise you, because in my kingdom, it's the opposite. In my kingdom, it is the one who serves that is the greatest. And by the way, I'm told in commentators that this passage in Luke 22 directly precedes Jesus rising and putting on the, um, the towel. So this is an incredible picture of humility. And Jesus is the one who serves. I just finished a book. And I have some friends that tease me about the books I read. And I won't say their name. I'll give you their initials, Janet Williams. But other than that, um, I love to read. And I especially love um, historical things. I'm not big into fiction. So recently I heard about a book, and it's called, um, uh, it's called In Order to Live. I highly recommend it. It's about North Korea. And this young girl who's even just today, like 24 years old, she writes about living in North Korea, growing up in that communist country, and then escaping through unbelievable odds. She and her mother and later sister were able to escape, and the story that she has to tell as a result of it. But I learned a whole lot about North Korea. And one of the main things I learned was the leader, these Kim Jong, Jong Un, he, call, he is called the supreme leader. These people are taught that he can read their thoughts, that he can hear what they say. They're absolutely terrified of the man. But he has literally trainloads, she gives examples, of food that are coming into his palace, and his people are starving, literally starving, and yet they worship him. It's unbelievable. When I was reading and studying this passage of 13, I was thinking, you're a servant leader. You're not a worldly, worldly um, supreme leader. You are a godly servant leader. And what an honor to serve one, someone like that. So let's get a real quick picture of what the um, room would have looked like. They would have walked into the room, and they would have had this, this table. And I looked it up. You might, if you're interested, look it up on the Internet. There's lots of um, archaeological studies and digs where they found these tables. They call them tri, let's see, what do they call Triclinium. That's the table. And it, it was either made of wood, it was either made of a table up here and two side tables, or it could have been marble that was beautifully made. Oftentimes on those tables they had a reclining area that would have gone down like that so that the people were kind of raised on some sort of level. 
so their feet were down at the bottom. They never put their feet under the table. Their feet always came out here. And so this is one of the reasons they were probably talking about who was the greatest was where they were going to sit. Because Jesus was going to be here at the head. And then to his right would have been um, John. And i got to get all this straight in my mind. I think this is John right here. And then this would have been, we don't know, could have been Judas. Because in our passage, we're going to read that Jesus said, whoever I dip the bread into uh, and feed this bread, that's the one that's going to betray me. He couldn't have reached anybody very far. It could have been that Judas was right there beside Jesus. And again, does that blow your mind? Mm -hmm. It does mine. It makes me really think. So um, the feet were right away from the table. And, and that is why when Mary went in and um, in our past, we, we haven't actually studied her um, washing the feet of Jesus, but that is why they would recline and they would put, they would, like if you're at the table, it's hard for me to demonstrate, but anyway, their head would be here, they would have their head resting on their left hand, and then they would be eating with their right hand, and their feet would be out here. That was why Mary could go in and wash his feet while he was eating, because his feet were away from the table. That was the common way of eating during that Greco-Roman time um, of our history. So their feet were not under the table. The idea was that Jesus was at a place of prominence, and John was on his right. The disciple whom he loved were told that in Scripture. And then, um, so it is possible that, that Judas could have been on his left. Jesus had to have been able to um, reach him. But part of the reason this foot washing is so important is because of their position. I mean, here they are. Their feet aren't under the table. Their feet are at the end there where they all are. They're smelly, dusty, dirty feet. And it was essential that they get their feet clean. But that was a servant's job. That was a lowly person's job to clean people's feet because they would have to get down on their hands and their knees, and they would have to wash their feet in a basin of water, and um, it, it was the way it had to be done because of the way they were in the room, placed in the room. It's interesting that um, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus himself goes into Simon the Pharisee's house, and Simon doesn't wash his feet. And you know what Jesus says? You didn't even wash my feet. He's accusing Simon of not respecting him, not doing the basic, basic hospitality. That's the first thing you do. And it was an incredibly offensive thing to not have your feet washed. So here's the problem. What have they been fighting over? Who's the greatest? And now, you want me to wash feet? Well, that is by no means the greatest. Nobody there was willing to get up and wash each other's feet, and they didn't have anybody else to do it. So that's the last thing they wanted to do, was wash somebody's feet. You see the point? Mm -hmm. You see how, what a big deal it is here? This cultural thing that Jesus had told them over and over that it's not for you to lord over the people or to be better than them. You're to serve them, but they still didn't get it because this cultural thing was so ingrained in them that they could not imagine that they would wash somebody's feet. So Jesus does something that absolutely stuns them. And I have a suspicion they were incredibly uncomfortable. You can see it with Peter's response. They're uncomfortable with what is happening. Because it was probably not incredibly uncom or unusual for someone of low stature to wash someone that they really revered. It wouldn't be such a big deal to wash their feet. That would be an honor. But Jesus, their leader, the one who is God, the God-man, decides that he is the one to wash their feet. And I am sure it stunned them unbelievably. So when Jesus got up and took off his outer garment and put on the towel and took the basin and began to wash their feet, they were overwhelmed. And I find it quite stunning because this whole issue of humility, there is a visual parable of what it means to truly be humble. 
Um, I am calling this study today the order of the towel. It might seem a little bit ridiculous. I, I was trying to come up with several names. I don't always name my lessons, but today this one just really fit. The order of the towel. What is happening? What is going on here? What I mean by the idea of the order of the towel is that we're called to do what Jesus did in our own arena of influence and the ones who we serve. Humility and the concept of servanthood go together. And we need to be willing to take up our towel and humbly serve just as Jesus did. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, 5, we find these words, and they are almost a direct correlation to what Jesus did in this gospel. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, clothe yourself with humility to one another. In other words, join the order of the towel. Clothe yourself with a towel that is going to represent what you are willing to do, and that is serve others. I think um, there's another reference to this idea in Philippians chapter 2, where it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing and took the form of a servant. That's what it means. He took the form and he put on the clothes of a servant and began to serve. A beautiful picture here. Humility, I think all of those passages and what we're studying here, that humility is not born out of poverty, it's born out of riches. The true humble person is the one that stoops below in order to serve. And Jesus was sovereign, but he chose to take the place of a servant. He had all things at his fingertips, and yet he chose to pick up the towel and serve. He's our Lord and our Master. And he served his followers. You see what he's doing here? He's showing us what we need to be doing. And he says it. Let's read verses 6 through 11 um, in our passage in John. <clears throat> he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now can you see his discomfort? I mean, this is uh, not the norm, and he's nervous about it. And Jesus answered him, what am, I, what am I am doing? You do not understand now, but afterward you'll understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share in me. And so then Simon Peter, being all in, like he always is, says, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my um, head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, not all of you are clean. Um, in that passage, we, we see that Peter is very uncomfortable. But he, when Jesus explains it to him, he says, Oh my goodness, well, not just my feet, my whole body. And then Jesus goes into this dissertation here to help us understand what he is doing here is not, is washing his feet. It's not about the cleansing of the power of Jesus' blood. That's already happened. Peter's already accepted <laughs> Christ as the Savior. Peter's already saved, if you will. Jesus is saying, this is not about your um, having been converted. This is about your communion with me. And that, you're feeding me. Because you are not staying completely clean all the time. Um, First John was also written by our author, John. And he says in a very clear passage there, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for sin. You know what propitiation means? It's a big word. <coughs> it means satisfaction. <coughs> Jesus has satis satisfied the penalty for sin. 
And so we have experienced salvation. Peter had experienced salvation. He believed in Jesus, but he still needed to confess because this was about the idea of communion with Christ, the idea of, of um, forgiveness. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that this picture that we're seeing here is Jesus telling Peter, No, you have been bathed. In fact, I'm told in one commentator, in one commentary, that it is a direct reference to an Old Testament passage in, Ex in Exodus. Is it Exodus or Leviticus? Anyway, that actually um, is referring to what happened in the temple when a priest was um, brought into the priesthood um, with the rites that they had to be done. They were completely bathed for the first time that they went into the temple. But that was the only time. They never were bathed again. From that point on, they were considered clean. They had been bathed once, and that's a picture of our salvation. <laughs> Um, so this idea here that Peter is confused about, Jesus is clear, but do they understand it completely now? No, but they will. They will understand it after the resurrection when the story has completely been played out before their eyes. So if it is our desire to do the Father's will, then we will be free to serve others just like Jesus because Jesus, what Jesus did... <laughs> what, what Jesus did because anyway uh, Jesus knew and he acted on what he knew it's, it's not making sense to me now but anyway whatever okay um, you know the better you know Christ the more you walk with him it's not a legalistic thing it's just that we have a desire in our heart to serve him and so it exposes more of who we really are deep inside. And we have a desire to be cleansed. We have a desire to be in communion with Christ. And so we need to get our feet clean, regular, daily. We're out in the dusty, dirty road, and we need our feet cleaned regularly. In verse 12, let's go on from there. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you know or understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then your Lord and the teacher have washed your feet, <laughs> you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent. If you know these things, you are blessed to do them. Does anybody remember in Scripture what blessed means? We see it in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they. Does anybody remember? Happy. Happy. Here's our formula for happiness. Right here. What is it? Serving others. Doing what Jesus said to do. Being in the order of the towel. Um, real happiness is found in serving and then in verse 18, it appears that Jesus pauses and he says, I'm not speaking of all of you. Now we go back to the heading of what Judas knew and what Jesus knew about Judas. And he goes on to tell us there, this is a picture of hypocrisy. Right there in the 12 closest men to Jesus, he betrayed Jesus. And Judas was not a true follower. He was a treasurer. He had an esteemed position. He walked with Jesus for three years, and yet he never knew Jesus. He pilfered their money. And the amazing thing to me is the disciples never got it. They never really understood what was happening. Even when Jesus handed, um, fed him the bread that he had dipped in the, whatever it was, um, that he had dipped there, and he fed it to Judas, the disciples, even at that point, after Jesus, and Jesus said to him, you know, go on, do what you're going to do, they think he's going out to pay alms to the poor or to get groceries for the next meal. They still do not get it. It's, it's amazing to me. But I want us to go back to this section right here where I said I would talk about. He loved his disciples. He loved 
those that God had given to him until the very end. Jesus knew he loved his own, and he wanted them to love others. So I'm going to read in verses 31 through 35. I'll start in verse, let's see, I'm having a terrible time saying up here. All right, 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, Little children, yet for a little while I'm with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, and by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I dare say, if I handed out a piece of paper to each one of you girls today, and said, would you rate yourself 1 to 10 on a scale for how much you love? I mean, how much you love other people? I would imagine, myself <laughs> included, I probably would write a 7 or an 8 down. I, I think I love people. I really try to love people. There's some that are harder than others, of course. But I, I really try to love people. But I think if we would get a picture of what Jesus is actually saying here, if we would read the fine print, just as I have loved you, I think we all would say, whoops, probably not a seven or an eight. Probably not. You know, very, very few people make it up to the top of Mount Everest and love that Jesus is demonstrating to us is the top of Mount Everest. Very few people ever even make it up there, but nobody lives up there. And that's the demonstration that we're seeing here. This Mount Everest kind of love that we fall so incredibly short of. On rare occasions, we might be able to demonstrate the kind of love that Jesus did, but for the most part, no. I want you to look at the love as we wind up here, the love that Jesus is talking about here. The first thing that I see in verse 31 and 32, where it says, Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me, and just as I have said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I think we see there a costly love. It is a valuable, costly love that, that is going to send Jesus to the cross. That's the kind of love Jesus had for these men. In verse 33, we see um, another characteristic of Jesus' love there, where it says, Yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. This is a caring love. Look how he addresses them. He's this little children. They weren't little children, but he was fond of them. He loved them. He addressed them as uh, little children. A, a, it was a, a picture of a father telling his kids, come on, let's have a hug-a-bug at my house. That's what my husband always calls it. And my grandkids think that is the greatest thing since sliced bread, to have a hug-a-bug with the whole family. We're all just hugging around. That's what he's saying here in Little Children. He is a caring father. And even in his death, he was caring. He was thinking about the future. And then we see in verse 34 um, where he says, um, a new commandment I give to you. A commandment. It's a commanding love. It's a love that has purpose. It's a commanding love. And then in verse 34, or it's actually 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And look at that verse. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, 
if you have love for one another. So not, not only was it costly and caring and commanding, but it was conspicuous. It was seen. You could see that Jesus loved them. Which brings me to my very final point about what all the people will know. If indeed we are followers of Christ and followers of him in this idea of serving, then all people are going to know. They're going to see us. And believe it or not, they're watching. We have a watching world out there. And they're looking to see if we really are little Christ. You know, that's what Christians mean. That word Christian means little Christ. Are you a little Christ? People are looking. They're watching. And if you fail, they're quick to talk. And it becomes a news item when certain people fall. Because they're watching. The watching world, the people will know if we have love for one another, that here we, that we are his disciples. So I want us to bring these five elements to a close here. Love, and I came up with a little definition of what I think biblical love is from these, these few verses at the end about all people knowing. Love is self-sacrificing, <coughs> it's caring, it's commanding, it's a commitment in obedience to Christ, and it will be seen by a watching world. The costliness of love means that there will be some sacrifice. The caring aspect means that we can't be rude, we can't be unkind. The commanding part is that love is obedient to Jesus and to his word. And then the conspicuous part is it doesn't just consist of nice thoughts. It has feet that get out and do and hands that we should be doing. I want you to think about this real quick too. i got to hurry. I want you to think about the kind of men that Jesus was serving that day. They were competitive. We saw it. They were selfishly ambitious. They were insensitive. They were uncaring. They were spiritually deaf. They were incredibly disobedient at times and disloyal. Does that sound like anybody you might know? It does to me. And yet, Jesus says, do as I did, serve others. I want to talk briefly about the order of the towel, because this has so impacted me this week. Um, the idea of taking up the towel and acting like Jesus. I looked up the word order, and Webster defines the word order as an authoritative command, direction, or instruction. I think you can agree with me, we've been given an authoritative command and instruction about taking up the towel, doing as Jesus said. Jesus said in verse 15 of our chapter, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So I want us to think about this order of the towel, and I want us to commit to modeling what it was to take up the towel and serve. I've done something for each of you today, and I do these crazy things from time to time, but it so impacted me, this idea of the towel, that I wanted you to be impacted with it as well. So I am going to have a little commitment ceremony right now to the order of the towel. And I am going to ask you to take the promise, to promise as well. Um, I'm going to take it first, and then I'm going to ask you if you want to take that promise this morning and make it your own, I'm going to ask you to stand and take the promise, and then I have something to give to each of you to remind yourself of, of what we've done this morning. But here's what I've written. I do humbly promise that I, Deborah Stevenson, will, this is emotional, will faithfully execute the words of my Savior to love as he has loved. To the best of my human ability, Understanding that all power is given to me by the Holy Spirit who lives in me, and thereby knowing that by this all people will know that I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, living my life to a watching world. Mm -hmm. If you would like to commit to that this morning, as corny as it might sound, stand with me and let me, let me call this out to you and you take it. You don't have to talk out loud. You can do it silently. But maybe you want to do like me and just make this commitment to Jesus and let this be something.
something that we really mean from the bottom of my heart. I do humbly promise that I put your name will faithfully execute the words of my Savior faithfully execute the words of my Savior to love as he has loved to the best of my human ability Understanding that all power is given to me by the Holy Spirit. Understanding that all power is given to me by the Holy Spirit. Who lives in me. Who lives in me. And thereby knowing that by this. thereby knowing that by this. All people will know. All people will know. That I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. That I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. To a watching world. Dear Heavenly Father, you've heard this promise. And I think I can say that we have said it from the bottom of our heart. We've promised to you that we will make this chapter 13 practical in our lives. I don't know what their world looks like. I don't know if it's in their family that they need to be serving. I don't know if it's in their neighborhood or in their church. But Lord, we all need to be serving others, believers or non-believers, because it is by that that we are going to be known as disciples of Christ, and we are going to be spreading the gospel. Now be with us and help us as we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Now before you leave...